it's 12.01, so let's go ahead. Um, so I am Hannah Frank. I am so thrilled to be hosting today's Implementation Science Core Seminar Talk with Dr. Ronnie Elwi. I am the Associate Director of the Implementation Science Core, and Dr. Elwi is the Director. We are so excited to welcome you to this week's seminar with Margaret Crane on disseminating information about evidence-based interventions. So it is my pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Margaret Crane. Margaret received her bachelor's in psychology from Harvard University in 2014 and began graduate school at Temple University in 2017, where she's currently a clinical psychology PhD candidate. She's also a clinical psychology resident at New York Presbyterian while Cornell Medicine. Margaret and I met during our time as graduate students at Temple University under the mentorship of Dr. Phil Kendall and the Child and Adolescent Anxiety Disorders Center. Margaret is an accomplished researcher in dissemination and implementation science. She was the recipient of a National Institute of Mental Health F31 grant for her dissertation. She has also received several awards in recognition of her excellence in the field, including the prestigious Shipley Research Prize from Temple University, as well as the Dissemination and Implementation Science Special Interest Group Student Poster Award. Margaret was elected as the student representative of the only international organization of focus specifically on implementation science, the Society for Implementation Research Collaboration. Margaret's research examines strategies to disseminate evidence-based practices for youth mental health. She approaches this by considering how to increase the supply of evidence-based practices via a combination of purveyor organizations to train practitioners and policies to fund these programs, as well as by considering how to increase patient demand of evidence-based practices. Although I could go on about Margaret's accolades, I wanna make sure that we leave plenty of time for her to speak. So without further ado, I will pass it over to Margaret. Thank you for that kind introduction. And thank you to Ronnie and Hannah for inviting me to talk today. I'm really thrilled to be talking to you all, all about dissemination strategies. Um, and so let's dive in. So I first just want to note that both the slides on and also some readings that are cited throughout are posted in a, full, a Dropbox folder. So you can scan this QR code to access it. And I'll have this again at the end of the slide. So if you if you miss it, you can catch it then. So just to give an overview about what we'll be talking about, I'll first give an overview about what is dissemination research. Then I'll talk about some dissemination um, theories, strategies, and outcomes. And then I'll go into three sample studies to show you how this can work in practice. So let's situate dissemin dissemination research within implementation science. So implementation science as a whole has kind of become a shorthand for both dissemination and implementation research, which is also abbreviated as DNI. But the fact that we call this implementation science rather than DNI science kind of indicates that research thus far has been a lot more focused on the implementation side of things. Um, but there's a lot more exciting research going on right now with the dissemination research. Um, I want to acknowledge that this slide has been borrowed from Dr. Jonathan Pertle. You'll see me citing him a lot. He's one of my mentors. He's been really influential in my thinking on dissemination science. He's also a brilliant implementation um, policy scientist. All right, so how does the NIH define it? The NIH luckily does think about both dissemination and implementation research. So implementation overall aims to bridge the gap between research practice and policy. Dissemination research itself is the distribution of information. So really, I think we can actually just shorthand dissemination to be targeted specific distribution of information. And the aim of that is to communicate and integrate knowledge. Implementation research, on the other hand, aims to help folks adopt and integrate evidence-based health interventions into practice. So while you often hear of this called DNI or dissemination and implementation science, that kind of indicates that they're conceptually distinct, but there's a lot of overlap. I think an arrow is actually a better way of describing these two fields because oftentimes dissemination is aimed at leading into implementation. I also, as an example of the fact that they're not really that distinct or sometimes strategies can overlap, let's take a training. So trainings can both be done to spread information, but they can also be at the start of implementation efforts. So in thinking about, you know, which bucket does it fall into? First of all, it doesn't really matter, <laughs> um, but also think about the broad goal or context. So are you aiming to spread information or are you aiming to change practices? Although that said, again, to blur the lines, oftentimes spreading information can change practices. 
Dissemination research is a field that doesn't really have one overarching framework to encompass everything. I think that's something that could be needed, but instead it borrows from many different areas that have existed for actually quite a long time. Um, and throughout this, as I'm talking about different frameworks or theories, there's a bunch that are related to dissemination or that could be. And so if you have other ideas, I just would encourage you to put those in the chat to you know make sure to select everyone so others can see, just so we can learn from each other. So one area that's really similar is diffusion. But unlike dissemination, which is um, more active and purposeful spread of information, diffusion is passive spread. And this active um, nature of dissemination really matters for health equity. Word of mouth, for example, is how a lot of people find out about evidence-based practices, but this could leave disadvantaged individuals out if they don't have access to that network. Health communication is also very similar. So this looks at how do we spread information about personal health behavior. So when that health behavior is an evidence-based treatment, we can then kind of can think of that as dissemination. Um, advertising is also quite similar. It often looks at purchasing behavior, but this could also be for a public good as well, as in, in the case of social marketing. So dissemination draws a lot of information from advertising research. And then applied political science. Dissemination research draws on this if we're thinking about political behavior. So it's relevant for dissemination campaigns targeted to policymakers. Let's look at some of the audiences that might be the target of dissemination efforts. I also want to acknowledge this is an incomplete list. Um, really kind of, I don't believe that any audience could be the target of a dissemination effort. Um, so some people that um, campaigns could target might include the general public, consumers, advocacy groups, providers, and policymakers. I want to note that some papers on dissemination or some frameworks on dissemination limit dissemination to be just to practice audiences. I quite frankly just disagree on this. I think it can be anyone who may affect the uptake of evidence-based practices. So in leaving out consumers, that's a really important audience, both because we wanna make sure consumers can make informed decisions about what treatments they decide to do, and also because they can help increase poll demand for evidence-based practices. So if consumers start asking for something a lot, that might motivate a provider to then get trained in that tr um, treatment. Or if consumers start asking for something a lot, that might motivate a policymaker um, to fund a treatment. And the general public as well, we know that public opinion matters to influence policymakers, decrease stigma, all of those things might impact other groups um, than uptaking evidence-based treatments or interventions. So let's talk about some relevant theories, strategies, and outcomes. So again, I just want to note this isn't a comprehensive list. We draw a lot from other fields. So as far as kind of knowing which one to pick, because there isn't really a nice, you know, go-to one. Like I really like CIFR for implementation science or, you know, a few of the other ones. But, you know, in thinking about which one to pick, you can think about what makes most sense for your research questions, um, you know, as far as what constructs it considers. A lot of these theories are really old and come from other fields. I just want to note that because we're not reinventing the wheel, as in the case of the implementation science as well. Um, but we can draw from knowledge of other fields to learn and help apply that to increase the uptake of evidence-based practices. So let's start by talking about diffusion of innovations. Um, so this was um, created from agriculture, actually, and thinking about aspects of innovations that increase spread. So we can think about this a little bit as a di um, dissemination determinants framework. So it thinks about what things might make something more or less likely to spread, but it's also something that you might want to address in dissemination initiatives. So some different factors that um, about in innovation. So this is the evidence-based practice itself. The first is thinking about um, relative advantage relative to the alternative. So how much better is the evidence-based treatment relative to what they're doing in practice? The greater the relative advantage, the more likely it is to spread. How compatible is it? How easy is it to fit within current practices? A lot of our evidence-based treatments or interventions are great, but they're kind of clunky, and maybe they're actually not very compatible with practice. To give an example from psychology or clinical psychology, um, um, Prolonged exposure or PE, which is for trauma treatment, is often recommended to be given in a 90-minute session, but in real life, those sessions are more like 45 minutes, so that might not be as compatible. Research, by the way, has actually shown that 45 minutes is fine, so that increases compatibility. So the more compatible, the more likely it is to be adopted, and the more likely it is to spread. Um, we also look at trialability, and so this looks at how easy is it to try it and abandon it if it doesn't work. I don't know about you, if I'm, but if I'm downloading an app from the app store and it's not free and I'm just trying to see if I like it, I'm probably not going to do it. I like if there's a free version because then there's no cost for me if I have to 
the abandonment. So the easy it is, or the more trialability, um, the more likely it is to spread. Um, and then also observability. And so how easy is it to observe others doing it? We're social creatures. Um, we like doing things that our friends like to do. Um, and so the more we can observe others doing it, the more likely are, we are to do it as well. I know from my clinic that I was trained in with Hannah, um, exposure therapy, which is an evidence-based intervention for anxiety, um, we could observe each other doing it. We could see our friends doing social exposures where we'd help kids be brave and you know talk to new people. Um, so that would increase the likelihood that we'd try doing it too. And then the last one is complexity. Um, so this one is the opposite of the other one. So we want this to be not complex, of course. So the less complex, the better, the more likely it is to spread. And again, with evidence-based interventions, they're kind of complex. So when we're thinking about messaging about these different interventions, we want to keep these things in mind because maybe the intervention is weak on some elements, but strong on others. So maybe we can highlight things or we, maybe we can explain how, well, yes, it might seem complex. Once you get the hang of it, it might make your life easier. The next one is the theory of planned behavior. So this theory comes from social psychology. And so these are constructs you may want to target in um, dissemination campaigns. Um, you can also think about, you know, understanding these things. So within a specific evidence-based intervention or behavior, which of these might matter the most? So for some people, um, one element might matter more than others. So the different factors that this theory um, talks about is attitudes. So do people like this intervention? Do they think it's easy? What do they think about it in general? Subjective norms, what do peers think that they should be doing? Um, so it's both what do you think other people are doing and what do you think other people would think you should be doing? Perceived behavioral control, um, this is basically, can I do this? Am I knowledgeable? Do I have the strategies? Are there structural barriers that might get in the way? So all these three things predict intention to do a behavior, which in turn predicts the actual behaviors from happening. Um, and so you might also notice that some of these things are targeted in implementation efforts too. Again, there's a blurry line between dissemination and implementation, but a lot of dissemination campaigns will try and target these different things and maybe try and shift subjective norms or shift you know, through knowledge, um, behavioral control. If people feel like they can do it more, um, they're more likely to. The elaboration likelihood model. Um, so this comes from social psychology. Um, and this, for some reason, the like jargon in this makes it seem a little more confusing than I think it actually is. So the idea of this is that information is processed either through a central or logical route or a peripheral or emotional route. So the idea behind this is that people process things logically if they're motivated and able to process a message. Um, and the perceived relevance matters here. So people think this message is more relevant to them. They're more likely to use logic. Um, to process a message. Otherwise, they might process it if there's an emotional cue in the message, either via a word, a metaphor, a story, or an image that might elicit um, an emotional response. You know, another thing that matters with this too is if the source is perceived as a trusted expert. Um, and so with dissemination, you want to keep these two roots in mind. Ideally, you want to increase and per perceived relevance because then they might target the um, process things more logically, but also including things like stories can help them process things emotionally too. Research has shown though that using the central route or logic um, creates a more lasting behavior change. So it's again, important to cue rel relevance there to help increase the likelihood they're going to use the logic route. The last framework or theory is direct from direct to consumer marketing. Um, and this is the four P's or the marketing mix framework. So these are the things you wanna consider in a marketing campaign. And within social marketing, that is the aim of that is to increase some sort of public good or doing something to promote something for the good. So it's not really actually to increase money. Um, and so it's called the marketing mix because these things should be considered at the same time as you're promoting something. So what are these P's? The first is the product you're promoting. So what is the evidence-based intervention? Um, how do you want to describe that intervention, for example? Um, what's the price of the product? And for this, we want to consider both financial prices, but also practical barriers. If patients have to come to the clinic to receive an intervention, that places a big practical barrier on them, especially if it takes a while. Um, place, so the place where the evidence-based intervention is provided, but then also where and from whom the advertising is done. Um, so for direct-to-consumer marketing overall, as I'm talking about this, um, I just want to flag, you, usually this is targeted to consumers, um, but you can really use the same framework for poly, um, providers as well. Um, and then promotion. Promotion is the campaign itself. So what key messages do you want to have? 
where are you going to put those messages up? When, how, um, how are these things market, uh, marketed? One thing I want to flag from existing research, this has been done largely by Sarah Becker, um, is the term evidence-based practice in itself. That's a term we really like to use as researchers, but a lot of the times people are either unfamiliar with that concept, they don't know what that means, it's jargon, <laughs> or they might not like the concept. They might think that that's something that's rigid. Um, or in the case of teens with a legal history or substance abuse, some parents have reported it reminds them of something that may be used in court. So we want to, you know, think about how do people perceive these messages that we're disseminating. Um, and for example, in this case, it's been recommended to use terms like treatments that work, or just to also describe the treatment itself. Um, people might be more favorable to some treatments if they actually understand what it's about, whereas the technical term might kind of confuse them. All right, so let's talk about some dissemination strategies. And again, if you have other ones you like, I'd encourage you to put them in the chat. Um, so the first one is audience segmentation. And actually, before I dive into these, I also just want to flag, um, I wrote a book chapter with Jonathan Pertle on this. Um, that's the Pertle et al. 2022. Um, and in hopes that someone reads a book chapter he wrote in part, but also because I, I do think it's actually quite good. Um, we go over a lot of these in more detail. So I'd encourage you to read these if you want more information. Um, and that's also in the folder with key readings. Um, all right, so the first um, strategy is audience segmentation. And so what this involves is separating your target audience based off of certain characteristics. And so there's a few ways you can do this. One is based off of demographic characteristics. These, so these are predefined things that kind of, you don't have to do a ton of work to actually understand. So in the example of policymakers, that might be party affiliation. Um, so you might perhaps give different, and basically the idea of these strategies or audience segmentation is you might tailor messages differently based off of the audience. Um, a little bit of a fancier way of doing this is through empirical clustering. So this uses statistics. So you take a lot of different characteristics about audiences um, and come up with different segments. And I'll give an example of this um, in a little bit. And so this is a more accurate way of segmenting. It's shown to be more predictive of actual behavior, but you need statistics. So it's a little harder. You might have to do a little bit more legwork ahead of time to actually get those clusters. Um, but the overall idea of audience segmentation is we shouldn't assume that everyone is going to receive the message in the same way, and it's much better to tailor messages to different people. All right, so with message tailoring, um, there's a few different ways you can do this. The first is personalization. So if you've gotten an email that has your name in it, that actually cues us to might re perhaps read it a little bit more. Um, it increases the relevance based off of the elaboration likelihood model. So if I think it's to me, I might be more likely to use that logical route. Um, we also can adapt the message. So that is modifying it for um, different types of people. For example, reducing costs, improving care, um, which kind of message might resonate more. So Republicans, we think of perhaps as they care more about reducing costs. Maybe Democrats might think about um, improving care more, but that's something that should be tested based off of the different type of intervention. Um, framing. So regardless of whether you're intentionally doing it or not, um, you are probably emphasizing certain aspects of the evidence-based intervention. And so framing, unlike ad um, adaptations, or might not always be adapted to specific audiences. So you can frame things, even if it's a general overall um, strategy that's not tailored. Um, and then the last strategy re relevant to message tailoring is feedback tailoring. So information about them, such as how many people they screen. So basically giving them information about themselves makes the message more relevant for them. So for example, if you're looking at cancer screening, giving them information about, hey, you screened X number of people for cancer this past year. Um, the evidence-based um, strategy recommends that you do Y or something like that. That makes them more relevant and helps them apply that information more. Um, and then another strategy I want to talk about is opinion leaders. Um, and so opinion leaders are change agents. These are trusted sources of information who can use their social influence to convince others. Um, this opinion leaders are seen both, again, in implementation, but also a lot in kind of social psychology theories relevant for implementation. Um, the thing that I'll talk a little bit more about opinion leaders, it's what I did my dissertation on, is that it's a, a little bit hard to identify, and B, 
an opinion leader for one person might be different than someone else. So it can be a little bit tricky to kind of get the nitty gritty. But either way, if you're thinking about a dissemination campaign, it's great if you can target like who within this community might be spreading this message. Because also after the dissemination effort has happened, um, they're probably going to keep talking about it. They're going to be the one that people are going to go to with questions. So involving opinion leaders can help make it more effective. The other thing too, involving them ahead of time can help you design your campaign better. Um, all right, uh, there's a question in the chat. Um, that's a great one between about discriminating between opinion leaders and champions. Not all opinion leaders um, are actually champions of the evidence-based um, practice. I think that's a great question. And I'd also love to hear from others how you've done this in your own work, um, which is the idea that sometimes opinion leaders are people who think something may or may not work, might not actually be the champion of getting it to happen. So I think of a champion as someone who is like the go-getter, trying to break down barriers, trying to make it happen. You work with them a ton in implementation efforts or dissemination efforts. They're your go-to person who's like the cheerleader. They're totally for the evidence-based intervention. Um, opinion leaders sometimes can be champions, but it's also possible that an opinion leader actually might not like the intervention. So as a very stereotypical case, Donald Trump is an opinion leader for many people. He didn't like vaccines or COVID. And so that was a bad thing for that COVID vaccination effort. Um, so I do think it's important to consider these as two different people um, in this effort. All right, how do we actually go about doing dissemination? Um, what are some different methods that we might be using? And so I also want to acknowledge that I'm giving this talk both kind of for practical tips, but also because if we're researching things, we need to know what does this look like in practice? So what does this look like at the different things we might be manipulating or testing different strategies of? Um, the first is advertisements. And so this can be in any sorts of forms. Um, the picture here is from a parenting program that was put on the side of a bus. Um, the other reason why they do this is it helps normalize getting parenting support. So if it's kind of everywhere, it helps normalize it. Um, as you know, this can be any form of advertisement though. So podcasts, print, social media, any way that you'd like to advertise. Um, the next one is kind of handout. So this could also be infographics. So this might be something that perhaps you're putting in a doctor's office as something parents can take um, to learn more about later on. Um, so the question is, how do we want to design these handouts so that they're the most helpful? Um, media stories. The screenshot here is actually of a story that came from Brown, which is really exciting about exposure therapy. Um, so this is about Park and what they're all doing, um, as well as an outside organization too. Um, so media is a really great way to disseminate information, um, both because the public reads it, but also policymakers pay a lot of attention to media. So thinking about if you're trying to target a local policymaker, targeting the local media, because they really do read that media. Um, when we think about media stories, again, think about all the different types of media. So this might be, again, print, digital, or in the news, um, or also like on TV. Um, I also just want to highlight media stories as well, because as researchers, we can do this dissemination whether or not we're actually studying it. So getting on the media and getting the word out about the things we're studying is really, really helpful, like, you know, helping people learn about it. Um, all right, the next one is on policy briefs. Um, I saw a question on, in the chat about good resources to learn how to prepare policy briefs. Um, I don't have a link like off the top of my head, but if you Google like how to do a policy brief, there's some really good strategies about like the certain formats that you should use, what to start with, um, et cetera. Um, so basically I'd, I'd encourage you not to say Google, but in some ways actually when I, when I did try and do that, I did find a lot of really good resources from different universities about again, how to frame things, what to start with, um, how long to make it, et cetera. Um, the other thing with policy briefs is I'd encourage you to reach out. Um, this is actually true in media as well, but if there is a policy advocacy office in your um, university, I think there is one at Brown for an example, um, they're fantastic to work with and they have a lot of strategies to really optimize these things and would love, I'm sure, to work with researchers um, or providers on how to actually craft this. Um, 
Likewise, if you're a provider in the community, um, a lot of professional groups probably have folks who are dedicated to doing different policy advocacy. So reaching out to them and saying, hey, I want to learn more about this. Um, can you help me write a policy brief? I'm sure they'd be happy to co-write it with you. Um, that's also true for media, by the way. A lot of universities, actually probably every university has a media office, um, and they're often very excited to hear about researchers wanting to talk to the media. So I'd encourage you to use those in-house resources because it also makes things a little bit less intimidating. All right. So this is a part where I want all of the audience to participate with um, about dissemination outcomes. So based off of all the different things that I've talked about so far, what might you measure in a dissemination campaign to see if it was successful? What might be some dissemination outcomes? Attitudes, that absolutely is one. So have people's attitudes changed about an evidence-based practice? Number of downloads. Yep, that's a really good one. So that looks at kind of engagement with different resources. Um, reach. I love re-aim for, you know, really all the things, but thinking about how broadly has this been reached? Um, are we reaching certain audiences more than others? In which case, especially if we are thinking about equity, um, how can we increase increase the reach to populations who are not getting already. Awareness, do people know about something? So I also want to differentiate between awareness and, and knowledge, which might be a little bit deeper. So we think about awareness as just, oh yeah, I've heard of that, whereas knowledge might be knowing actually more about that. Um, intention to use, yep, absolutely. So I'm going to switch to the next screen. Feel free to keep putting them in the chat. Um, there's a bunch of different outcomes. I'll also again flag a lot of these overlap with some implementation outcomes. Um, I'm not going to read through all of these because there are a lot. Um, but, you know, the reason why this is, again, of course, important to think about is how are you going to measure this campaign? Um, because how we want to measure it also might affect how we're designing the campaign. And so, for an example, if we're doing something to policymakers, maybe we want to look at engagement. And so we want to make sure that the email that we're using has um, software in it that can you can use to see view rates or click rates. Um, so perhaps using um, specific software or um, rather than just sending it from your personal email, can help you understand more about how effective that campaign would be. Um, a lot of these are measured with surveys as well. Um, you know, with dissemination, if we're doing it really broadly, survey response rate might not be super high, um, but, you know, perhaps it would at least give you some information more than what you would get if you didn't ask the question or do a survey. Um, for some of these things as well, especially when we're looking at actual behaviors, you can look at things like administrative data, um, proposing policies in themselves, um, forward shares, cross links between sites, audience location. Yep, those are all really great things to look at with um, different engagement metrics. Um, so just some other ones as well, things like link click rates, social media views, likes, retweets, um, I think website volume visit. I don't know if that was on there, but that's another way we can look at engagement. So a lot of this is thinking about, okay, are people actually seeing and interacting with this material? With engagement as well, it, the data can get really messy. I'll also just give you a heads up about because perhaps someone might see a tweet, but are they actually clicking the video in the tweet to actually engage in a deeper way? And so just thinking about, you know, social media views might not actually be the full metric you might want. Um, engagement can also be tricky if perhaps you had an email that summarized a policy very briefly and then a policy brief. Let's say you really want them to read the policy brief, but maybe your email actually just gave them the information they want. So again, thinking about, you know, how might these metrics interact with your actual outcomes that you're wanting to see. All right, so how do we put this actually together? And so again, this is useful both for researchers who are doing a dissemination campaign and then evaluating it, and then also for um, providers or practitioners, really anyone. Um, and I just want to encourage you to try thinking through all of these different aspects before we're doing a campaign, just to make sure it's going to be as successful as you want. So the first step is defining the goals of the dissemination campaign. Um, while that might seem obvious, but the goals are really going to um, drive the strategies you're going to use and also how you're going to measure the goals. Um, in dissemination campaigns in particular, I think thinking about proximal goals is really helpful. Well, yes, we might want a policymaker to enact a law. Reading materials is probably a more proximal goal that we can measure, especially within a study timeline. Um, both with goals, but also with audience. I hope that they're defined with the target community. The more we work with people who are actually aiming to have their behaviors change, the better this, these efforts are going to be. It's easy to kind of forget how much we know and how 
you know, or what perspectives we may have versus what perspectives other people may have. And so again, working with the community throughout is really helpful. Um, so the next step is defining and characterizing your audience. So you can think about the goal overall might be to enact a policy, but who's your audience? Again, this helps you know who to interact with and collaborate with. Um, but then also think about what's their background. So what's their knowledge on the topic currently? Um, maybe the audience isn't actually a legislator themselves, but maybe a staff member who has a lot more expertise in a health topic. Um, also think about how broad their influence is. Is it federal, state, local for policymakers? Um, but this is true really with anyone who you're trying to give information for. That helps you understand kind of what level of data they might wanna see or what are they thinking about when they're making decisions. Um, in characterizing your audience, it's useful to understand, again, their knowledge, but also attitudes, intentions, behaviors. So kind of the things you're thinking about changing, understanding where they're currently at, because maybe we might think that someone has really low or poor attitudes about something, but maybe actually they're pretty much okay with it, in which case we don't need to focus our efforts as much on changing attitudes. Um, the four Ps of this also plays into um, a role. So getting feedback and defining and characterizing your audience about what they think about those four Ps. So how, uh, you know, what the place that should be promoted in, what's the product like, what's the price, what promotion channels. Um, the next step is developing dissemination materials um, and then also distributing them. So this is actually making the campaign. I encourage you to work with graphic designers um, if you're not already skilled with that, just because pretty things help with dissemination campaigns. They're more eye-catching, they're easier to read. Um, there's a good rule, especially for policymakers. So on the note of policy briefs, because um, we're not just actually making a brief, we need to get it in front of them, um, which is the 333 rule. So it, it takes, you have about three seconds to capture their attention. That's often with the subject line. 30 seconds to persuade them that this material is worth engaging with. That's often the body of the email and then three minutes to engage them with the actual material. So that's the policy brief. The policy brief should be something that's digestible in three minutes or less. Um, I also separate it out like that because brief emails have been shown to be more effective with interacting with policymakers. I know we all kind of have fatigue. As soon as you open up a long email, you're like, oh my gosh, I can't do this. Um, so it's better actually to keep the body brief, something they can digest in 30 seconds to say, okay, yeah, I wanna learn more. Um, including visuals. Again, that's more visually pleasing. It's easier to digest. Um, infographics are great, personal narratives, that just helps make things more personal. It speaks to that emotional root of understanding information. Um, yeah. And then the last step is evaluating the campaign. So whether or not you're doing this for research, I think it's so useful to evaluate campaigns to know it works, to know which efforts are worth doing. I know within our clinic, um, when we started asking people how they're referred, we realized that advertisements in like public transportation really wasn't doing very much and it was really expensive. So we were able to pull back on that because we were asking people and getting information about those campaigns. Um, when you're evaluating things, obviously randomization is great. That's not always possible in the real world, but you can even randomize different email strategies. And so maybe you want to see how does this message resonate better with other people as far as engagement rates. And email randomization is actually quite easy to do. Um, you can also assess things without randomization. If you're giving one group one thing, one group another, of course, there's some that, that limitation of it wasn't randomized. All right, so let's talk about how this looks in practice, um, especially from a research perspective. Um, so I'll also just say that I think, again, dissemination research is a little bit on the earlier side of things. And so a lot of the research questions are, um, you know, I think it's get, starting to get to the stage where we can look a little bit deeper than some of these, um, some of these studies perhaps looked, um, or some of the studies out there perhaps looked, just in that, you know, thinking more about changing behaviors and, you know, less on perhaps determinants or things like that. Um, but in any case, this study is actually really great. This is one of the better ones. Um, so this was done by Sarah Becker, and it looked at, um, she's also another mentor of mine and just inspired a lot of my work. So I want to give her a shout out too for that. Um, so what this study looked at is it compared two different ways of marketing. Um, so she first did um, a survey to get a, a sense of the marketing mix, so to get a sense of preferences. And then she took that and made a user-informed infographic, um, which is the thing on the left, comparing that to a standard description. of, um, And this is from the Americals, American Psychological Association on the right. You can already see that the one on the right is much denser. Um, and so basically the user-informed infographic, a few things that she talked about that I want to highlight. Um, the term therapy can help, 
that helps destigmatize therapy rather than just saying, hey, it's really prevalent, you know, these problems are prevalent. We want to give people hope. Um, the term effective therapy, not evidence-based treat practice. Um, and then also the line, every teen is different. That's emphasizing the fact that these evidence-based practices can be tailored. Um, and then she looked at perceptions of the infographic, intentions to seek um, therapy, and then also requests for more information about seeking therapy. So that was kind of a proxy for action. So what she found overall is there was no interaction by conditions. So both of those conditions performed fairly well overall. Um, um, both um, parent reported behavior intentions and then also requests for more information. So did they click a link to um, ask for more information? That said, when she dove a little bit deeper, there was an interaction between condition and adolescents with substance use problems. This was the target population. So she was um, designing this campaign for parents of adolescents with substance use problems. And in that case, the user informed um, infographic outperformed the standard messaging. So this is the one who it's more relevant for them. And so again, thinking about the elaboration likelihood model, um, perhaps when the relevance was higher, it mattered a little bit more actually about how that information was presented. All right, audience segmentation. Um, so this paper was done by Jonathan Pertle and colleagues. Um, and so he looked at characteristics, or they looked at characteristics um, of legislators that they collected from a survey. So they'd done this survey in the past and gotten um, different factors of these legislators. So things like perceptions of behavioral health treatment effectiveness, stigma, um, budget consciousness, their perceptions of evidence, how much they're prioritizing, mental health or substance use. Have they ever introduced a bill on mental health? Have they ever introduced a substance abuse bill? Um, and then they used LCA to categorize types of legislators, and they looked at predictive validity of those categories. Um, so this study is the one I was talking about when I was saying that using more advanced statistical techniques of audience segmentation is better um, than just using um, existing characteristics. So first of all, they found there was kind of three different types of legislators. One, action-oriented supporters, um, so people who are likely to in introduce bills, for example. Um, and so they defined this based off the characteristics that they saw. Um, Passive supporters, so people who are, yes, likely to vote yes, but probably aren't those really strong advocates um, or are champions. Um, and then budget-oriented skeptics with stigma. So these are people who had a very strong budget orientation. They were skeptical about evidence-based practices, and they had high levels of stigma. And they found that these segments, um, or these three memberships, were stronger predictors of support of state parity laws than almost any other demographic or party affiliation variable. Um, and so, again, this supports the benefit of audience segmentation. It also suggests that perhaps we want to really target budget-oriented skeptics because these are the people who are maybe likely to vote no, and this is also a pretty large group. Um, and these people, because they had a lot of stigma, they might be likely to contribute to structural stigma. Um, on the other hand, you also could sometimes argue that maybe you want to actually target the passive supporters to make them more actively involved, or maybe you could ignore them because they're going to do it anyway. So maybe you want to help the action-oriented supporters to actually have the information about what sorts of laws you want to be seeing passed. All right, so this last one is my dissertation. Um, and so in this, I looked at two versions of giving an outreach presentation for caregivers on youth anxiety and how to seek treatment. So I was really encouraging them to seek exposure therapy for their child. So exposure therapy is where kids slowly face their fears. And it's the key ingredient in the most and evidence-based practices for youth anxiety. So I compared when this presentation was given by me and a local key opinion leader who I trained and co-presented the information with versus me and a colleague. So I was looking at, does the source of this information matter? So the key opinion leader, when they were involved, that's a key opinion leader condition. Me and a colleague, that's the researcher only condition. For this, I used the theory plan behavior to evaluate, um, to both evaluate this um, dissemination effort, but also thinking about this throughout. So how can we reduce stigma? How can we increase subjective norms um, and change attitudes and increase behavioral control? So I was trying to change all these things in the presentation itself, but then I also used it to evaluate it. And I want to note here that stigma I kind of thought was in between subjective norms and attitudes. These frameworks are imperfect and that's okay. We don't need to reinvent the wheel necessarily. We can still use them and tweak them as it might fit. And so from this study, um, there was no interaction effect, which basically means that both conditions um, were actually effective, but the key opinion leader condition quantitatively was not more effective. I'm currently um, analyzing the qual data and it seems like the benefit of having a local parent involved showed up more in the qual information. 
Um, but again, basically the interaction effect might not have been present because there was a strong main effect. So both groups, things improved with. Um, so all of the different things you'd wanna be seeing, there was a lot of improvement, not with stigma because that was actually pretty um, low to begin with. So there was a bit of a floor effect. Um, so overall, the conclusions from this was that the outreach presentation was an effective dissemination strategy. Um, the parents after this sought exposure therapy at a pretty high rate, higher than I would guess they would normally. Um, but also that key opinion leaders maybe aren't necessary for all dissemination efforts. It might be more beneficial for individuals with higher levels of stigma or skepticism that were found in this sample. Um, we also evaluated what people thought of us and that helped us understand that people actually viewed the researchers as being more trustworthy and a more credible source of mental health information than the parents we were presenting with. So thinking about who's the source is really important and what do people think of those sources. So in doing these sorts of efforts, I encourage you to do that sort of evaluation because if the results maybe aren't quite what you think, it you know that sort of survey can help elucidate why. Are there any good frameworks to study stigma? Um, Yes, and I'm not going to know them off the top of my head right now. Um, there are a lot of different frameworks as far as like types of stigma, and they go into like a lot of nitty gritty detail about different ways of do, um, thinking about stigma. I'd be happy to email you more um, resources if you email me. My email will be on the slide in a few in a few slides. Um, when we are thinking about stigma, though, a few things to think about include structural stigma. So that's things like policies. Um, that might create structural barriers to accessing care that is based off of stigma that would created them. Um, we also can think about public stigma. So this is overall what people think about other people. Um, and then another type of stigma to keep in mind is internalized stigma. So what do I think about myself based off of me having something? Family stigma is similar. So what do I think about myself based off of my family member having a disease? That's really important for parents because parents, if they feel a certain way, based off of their child having something, they may be more or less likely to seek treatment. There are frameworks though that go into a little bit more detail than that though. All right, so just as a final thought, again, I wanna advocate for you all to be dissemination practitioners, regardless of what your role currently is. Um, and one thing with this is also just contacting your representative. So we all have the ability to change things. And actually, I think probably doing this probably is going to have a bigger impact than a lot of things I do in my research. Um, so these examples are from mental health because that's my area. Um, and so respect for marriage act so that there's a lot of evidence that su supports um, equality as having beneficial mental health impacts. Um, climate change, health protections and promotion acts. So that's thinking about how might climate change impact health. Um, and then the APA also had just a comprehensive mental health reform and advocating for the need for that. Um, so to find this information, um, for at least the American Psychological Association, they have a great advocacy arm. So their website's listed there. Um, thinking about a state level, state professional groups often have things they're advocating for. And I encourage you to look at those things. Yes, email them about what things you care about, for, you know, separate from this. But if you can kind of tag on to a larger advocacy campaign, that might help amplify the voice of what you're doing overall. So I would just encourage you to do that. All right, and we have time for questions. Thank you so much, Margaret. That was a wonderful presentation. And I loved getting to learn more from you about dissemination and always hearing more at each stage of your dissertation is exciting. So thank you. Um, I would encourage people to put more questions in the chat. It looks like there is one more right now about dissemination strategies that might help shape societal norms. And so I'm curious if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so one thing I think about is what do people see overall? So thinking about what media portrays as in like, what, what do people see on TV? Um, how do newscasters discuss these different things? Um, what do people talking about in social media? I think a good example of this is that um, Gen Z is a lot, I think has a lot less stigma. They're seeing a lot of things on TikTok that the rest of us didn't see growing up. Um, so what information is kind of out there in the public conversation? I think key opinion leaders are fantastic for shaping societal norms. So seeing things like, um, various athletes talk about, you know, disclosing their own mental health struggles. So self-disclosure is a really effective strategy to normalize different things. Um, I also think those societal norms are also shaped by like laws. What are we seeing lawmakers enact? That kind of shows that, you know, maybe discrimination is okay in certain states, which is really not ideal. <laughs> um, 
And so, you know, what lawmakers are doing is really important for shaping those norms. You know, if, if they're talking in a certain way that can kind of normalize it, maybe that's okay for other people. Um, so really thinking about who's spreading messages overall and what messages they're spreading. Um, so as far as specific strategies, I'd say working with those people. So working with, you know, TV producers or media people about what, what's being shown on different TV shows, um, collaborating with influencers on things like TikTok, um, I think can help shape societal norms or Instagram. I think there's a lot of parenting um, people on Instagram, for example, I think collaborating with them about what messages they show. And then also working with policymakers. I think the dissemination strategy I didn't talk as much about is just forming a relationship with a local policymaker. One-off communication, yeah, that's great, but oftentimes laws are changed based off of a more sustained relationship. So if you can be kind of their trusted expert in a certain evidence-based practice or just how do we treat you know, X health problem, um, they're more likely to then trust what you're doing. So if they can come to you for things that maybe aren't as much your passion and, you know, you can help them quickly later on when you're advocating for them, they might be more likely to listen. So kind of relationship building is another, I think, key dissemination strategy I've talked less about. Great. Thank you. And there is another question in the chat, but first, just to piggyback off what you were just saying, I'm curious if you could speak a little bit more to what you see as the role of social media in dissemination science, um, just briefly, and then I'll get to our next question. Yeah, I think it's hugely important. Um, and the cool thing with social media is there are ways to analyze um, what's being said on social media. Um, TikTok is the hardest because it's analyzing videos, but there was a study, for example, looking at um, what content TikTok creators about ADHD and the most viewed videos were putting out and how evidence-based is it? Unfortunately, it wasn't really largely. Um, and in fact, some of it was spreading in misinformation. So, you know, just doing kind of coding studies, but um, tweets, for example, are a lot easier to analyze because there's software you can use to like download tweets in bulk and then analyzing text is just a little bit easier. Um, sometimes machine learning can be really helpful for that as well, both for tweets and also like Facebook comments and posts. Um, those same methods can also be used, by the way, for analyzing what's in the media. So thinking about what's the media conversation around this topic right now? Did that media conversation help, you know, was there a certain conversation in states that did pass this law versus states that didn't pass this law? Likely, yes. Um, so that can point to the benefit of having media advocacy as a method of disseminating things. Yeah, I love that. Lots of innovative ideas for research methods, too. Um, so a couple, actually, I'm sorry, Alethea, for skipping your question, but I promise I'll get to it because there's another one that piggybacks off the conversation we we're just having, um, which is if you know if and how dissemination strategies can be used to combat misinformation. So one example is CBD is a panacea for all mental health concerns. You mentioned the example of ADHD on TikTok. Um, thoughts yep. on that? That's a great question. Um, there's a theory that I really like called the inoculation theory. Um, this came from climate change and cli climate skepticism. Inoculation theory actually came overall from literally vaccines. Um, but the idea of this theory, so John Cook is someone to look into. He has a really nice website of like all of the different strategies you can use um, to combat like science skepticism, which I think applies. Um, but overall, again, I think science skepticism drawing from that. Um, because there's kind of a whole field on that, but I think it's absolutely applicable to dissemination and perhaps even a field that should be on the slides. <laughs> um, but so what basically what the inoculation theory um, describes is you first want to state a fact. Um, so whatever the fact is about, you know, CBT and how it works, and then you want to state, however, some people might say X. So you want to state that misinformation. I might be actually getting some of these steps a little bit backwards. Um, but then you want to describe what strategies they use, what information, misinformation strategies they use to spread that. So helping educate people to recognize, okay, maybe that's a red herring, or maybe that's, you know, some other strategy of spreading misinformation, um, or straw man argument. Um, I don't know which exactly it would be for CBT is a, a CBD is a panacea, um, but describing again, the misinformation strategy that they're using and then concluding by restating the fact. And so what that kind of does is it inoculates people against misinformation so that when they're more likely to see it again, they kind of understand what's going on and can more likely say, oh, that isn't true. I see that this is that, you know, that straw man effect or whatever. Um, so that they can then become more informed consumers later on. Um, and so, you know, that I think is really helpful to do. For example, people go on news channels um, to use kind of that 
pronged strategy of first, what's the fact? Because we want, you know, people have tuned out after that. We want them to remember the fact. Then what's the misinformation strategy to kind of debunk it? And then again, repeat the fact because we want them to remember the fact. Yeah, I love that. That's a, a great way to think about it. Um, and one of the other questions, again, on a slightly different topic is if you can provide examples of tools or methods to measure key concepts of diffusion that you described earlier. A great question. I'm just going to go back to the slide um, just so, you know, everyone has this. Um, and I mean, I think in some ways, like survey data can be helpful. I also think as with all of implementation science, mixed methods can be really beneficial. Um, you know, so qualitative surveys to kind of assess these different things and to assess what do people actually think about this? Um, because sometimes our quantitative measures Either they don't exist a lot because this is a relatively new field, so maybe they don't have psychometric properties, or also they just might have shortcomings of not getting the rich information that Qual has. Um, so we're relative, I mean, for a lot of these things, I think, look, just asking people through surveys and, or, you know, either quantitative or qualitative surveys. Um, I'm trying to think if there's a behavioral way of measuring it and you know, I, I, I feel like there might be, and if there, if someone has an idea for that, feel free to put it in the chat. But, you know, I, I think just measuring it either through a survey or through a qualitative interview would be how I would do that. But again, designing a qual interview based off of these different concepts to try and tap these different things. It also helps analyze results. Journals, everyone likes it when there's a framework that's being used to design a study. Um, grant reviewers as well. Yes, I, I had been thinking about this question too of measures and it sounds like dissemination sort of has many of the same issues as implementation science where there's maybe a movement toward developing measures and at this point a lot of them are survey based or qualitative which of course gets you really rich data. Um, yeah, so. by the way behavior ethnogra ethnographic was put in the chat. Absolutely. I think that's a fantastic way to do it. You know, observing people in practice. What are what are they actually doing day to day? What does their day look like? Um, I think it's easy to start. I'm currently in a primary care clinic. It's a lot easier to appreciate how hard it would be to add anything <laughs> to pediatricians jobs um, now that I'm here. And so, you know, immersing yourself in the setting. Absolutely. I think is really helpful. Yes, for sure. Um, all right, frameworks to identify barriers and design solutions in dissemination practice. Um, so in this, like, yes and no. Um, dissemination, again, is a much younger field. I actually think we are a little bit more in this stage of identifying barriers and facilitators. Um, that said, there is a really great review by um, Anna Bauman and colleagues that is in the reading list um, and the article is also there. I'm gonna go back to the end slide so folks can scan that QR code. Um, and basically she did a review article on dissemination research and strategies and um, discussed different barriers. A lot of the barriers though are things from the slide I just came from of you know things like attitudes, cost, what people you know, what people care about, are they able to do it? Um, subjective norms, um, those sorts of determinants, I think, often come in. Designing solutions to dissemination practice. Um, you know, I'm just thinking about there's some really great websites for implementation science, like I think like DNI.org maybe is one that like you can match things really well. I think they have some things on dissemination as well. Um, but like dissemination is just a much younger field. And so I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm not thinking about it in the same way. I, I know that implementation has so much, so many online resources. Um, Again, generating lots of ideas for future um, projects and questions and ideas, and I love it. Um, Ronnie had a question where she mentioned loving your emphasis on collaborating with graphic designers to support dissemination and was curious about how this works in practice in your experience. That's a great question. Um, so I actually haven't done that yet. I like designing infographics. So I've designed some myself. Um, but I think, I mean, in some ways, I would say ask Twitter if anyone's had someone they like working with or ask colleagues if they've had someone who they liked working with. Um, you know, I'd imagine some are just good at anything. There also might be pe some people who are specifically skilled in health communication um, who might be worth noting. I, I don't have anyone I know off the top of my head. Um, but yeah, I think that's a, a great question. And then, you know, they also would probably give really interesting feedback on like, okay, this text is too heavy. Um, another kind of tip in general about generating information, you want to think about the language level. You can check that pretty easily in Microsoft Word. I think in like spell check, there might be a box you have to check to get it. Um, but really making sure that it's written at a fifth grade level 
both because yes, that helps it be more widely applicable, but also just because it's easier to read and easier to understand. So even if you're disseminating it to expert audiences, making the language as simple as possible just makes it easier. That's such a great point. Um, I have one more question for you. And then again, we have a few more minutes. If anyone else has questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, you mentioned toward the beginning the value of word of mouth and how so much information is disseminated via word of mouth. And so I'm curious what your thoughts are on how we can sort of leverage that and pair that with dissemination strategies to really make use of this thing that's naturally happening. Absolutely. So I'm fascinated by word of mouth. Um, and one thing before I answer your question, I think like network analyses are really could just do a lot of value in dissemination science of understanding how people get information, who their network naturally is, trying to find kind of the central node of that network of who's spreading information most. And then perhaps they could be a target of dissemination strategies. Um, I got excited by sharing that and kind of forgot your question. So could you repeat it a little bit more? Just how to leverage word of mouth a little more? Yeah, exactly. In terms of like how that how that fits with existing dissemination strategies. Yeah, it's a great one. You know, I think we can harness that of like prompting people of like tell a friend, um, you know, not necessarily like referrals that we would get as like you'd get money, but encouraging people like if you found this helpful, tell a friend or even also, um, you know, asking people like what's an email of someone else who might find this useful, because um, basically, you know, that's almost doing the word of mouth for them. Um, you know, also asking people like what information could help spread this via word of mouth. Um, some of going back to social media stuff, some of the things about what makes a video go viral, I think are relevant too. Um, you know, there's certain videos that I've received from multiple friends because there's something about them that's really catchy. Um, so thinking about how to make our information easy to spread via word of mouth. So also what's a sound bite? So, you know, with the pharmaceutical industry, they have asked your doctor about, you know, if Prozac's right for you. We don't really have that as much in psychology, for example, and probably not in a lot of other fields. Um, so thinking about, you know, what is the thing we're asking people to ask for? Because that's also the thing they're going to then tell their friends about. Um, yeah. Awesome. I love that. And last question before we wrap up, are there any tips you have for disseminating messages to policymakers? Are things about that disseminating to that audience different? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I first want to just point you towards a reading again, um, in that one of the articles I put in that folder is just like 12 key points of disseminating to policymakers. Um, some of the ones that stood out to me the most is keep it simple and brief. They're getting flooded with this information. Um, be a human. So not trying to use kind of like a scare tactics or things you think advocacy groups might be doing, um, but just like write it like you would to a friend sort of thing. Um, and then, yeah, make it easy to read. Um, but again, I'd, I'd encourage you to reference that handout because it has some really good strategies of things that people who've done this a lot have learned. Um, and then messaging to different types of policymakers, um, thinking about what priorities they care about, also targeting the person who's on the committee that's going to pass that bill. Um, so there are certain policymakers that are on committees related to health, for example. Um, so if you're going to target efforts, especially kind of building more of a relationship, um, reach out to people who are on that committee because they're likely to propose a bill first. Um, all right. I think awesome. I'm going to hand it back to you all to conclude us. Yes, thank you so much, Margaret, and thank you for sharing all those resources, too. I'm sure that will get at a lot of questions that people had and let us all keep thinking about this. So next Tuesday, um, December 6, we have Dr. Alethea de Rogers, who's in our Implementation Science Core, and she'll be presenting on applying implementation science to address the global mental health treatment gap. So we look forward to seeing many of you next week, and thank you again, Margaret, for this wonderful presentation. Thank you so much for having me and thank you all for coming. Feel free to reach out if you have extra questions.